Well, it's, a, it's an absolute privilege to be here. I'm Keith, and uh, we have been supporters of 20 Schemes and, uh, for a number of years. But it's a privilege to be here, I guess, for many reasons. The first time my wife and I ever got to share in this city was at Charlotte Chapel. And of course, this, this is a church with a wonderful history and heritage. We would hear from it in, in Northern Ireland. We have some of your pastors over to speak. Um, uh, Alistair Begg became my pastor for many years and, and it, it, when we first moved to America. Uh, and your current pastor, Paul Reese, uh, had us when he was in Spokane, Washington. So we had a few good days together, uh, and I've been and I've kept those friendships up ever since. So it's wonderful to be back and to see your new building. Last time I was with Paul, he was talking at 100 miles an hour about all the excitement about this place. So just to be here is, is very exciting. And uh, but as I said, to be here with 20 Schemes is is great. We first got involved in an event in the great state of Kentucky a number of years ago, a Christmas event, and I've been involved with them ever since. And I'm so thrilled to see it grow, uh, Mez. To see it grow in the, was Mez here wherever he is. Uh, so it's thrilled to see it grow at, at the same speed that Manchester United are declining. Both give me huge pleasure and delight to watch. And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, we, uh, um, and to, be a part of, to be a part of this conference and to be a part of this work that you guys are involved in. But even just this morning, I woke up. I woke up. We were, we did a, we were doing a thing on, on BBC Scotland this morning about the heritage of, of Irish and Scottish hymn writing. And just to be made aware again of the extraordinary heritage that all of us have as people from Scotland, from Ireland, north or south, um, that has come before us. Even in the last week, as a hymn writer, I've been working on, Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, who like we his praise should sing. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise the everlasting King. Thinking about that verse, frail as summer flowers we flourish. It's a paraphrasing of Psalm 103. Frail as summer flowers we flourish, blow the wind and it is gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures, unchanging on. Henry Francis Light, he was born in Kelso. Now, he was educated in Northern Ireland, which probably made him a, so, so why he was so clever. <laughs> but, um, but born in Kelso. Last week, our, our, we had our writers. Uh, getting me to our publishing company who published Modern Hymns. We had all our writers over in Ireland two weeks ago, and we were trying to work out when this fleeting world is past, or when this passing world is done. It's another paraphrasing of Robert Murray McShane's hymn that we long for heaven. And indeed, the last year, we started a project to set the Psalms for the 21st century. So the Scottish Psalter is a part of, of my diet, um, devotionally and of my work every day I live. What? It is an extraordinary heritage that all of us have. So I want to just begin with a prayer um, and a prayer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just share a little bit about, about singing and the importance of singing. Then I'm going to teach you two or three songs that might be helpful in helping you um, in your congregations. Uh, and then we're going to hopefully have a little bit of time at the end for questions, for one-minute questions, okay? So it's going to be a very, very, it's going to be a quick race through. I have to be done by 11.50, is that right? So, um, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a very much a, a fast run across everything, but but why don't we pray before we begin? Uh, who have we in heaven? But you and on earth, nothing we desire beside you. Though our flesh may fail, God is our strength and our portion forever. And our heavenly Father, we come before you this morning somewhat overwhelmed as we think of the generations who have, who have walked these streets to share your gospel with people, for pastors, for teachers, for, for parents, for tradesmen, for businessmen, for people who were the architects and the builders behind these beautiful churches. Father, we thank you for each one of us for those who invested into our lives, for grandparents and parents, for the Sunday schools that we went to or the, or the neighbors that were a faithful witness. And Father, we thank you that, that they brought to us your gospel. And we stand here today, Father, with gratitude for each one of them. And Father, we stand here with, with a, a heavy burden that each one of us have to, to faithfully pass on to the next generation 
the beauty and the riches of Christ, the life-transforming news of your, of your gospel that can change lives and families and communities. And Father, we pray in this day that in all our conversations, in the things that are said from the front, in the words that are sung, in the examples that are set, in the laughter that is had and the tears or whatever it is, Father, we pray that you will give each one of us wisdom and strength, embolden each one of us uh, to serve with, with, with more wisdom and joy uh, your kingdom in the place that you have put us so that generations to come will yet praise you in these cities and tell of your marvelous deeds. Amen. So I grew up as in County Antrim and uh, grew up at a, a, a church, about 300 people. It was a Presbyterian church. And uh, we, we, I, I love church music. I got into church music at the age of 10. And like many of you who are in church music, how many of you, by the way, are church musicians who are here? Okay, so probably about half of you at least are church musicians. Like many of you, I started to play and then played in church. And, and it really had the, privilege, have the, had the privilege of church music help shape so much of my own spiritual identity. It, 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 it helped, I, it got me into singing scriptures. It got me into singing hymns. It got me into being in church services, sitting under preaching, having older role models, having friends that were believers. And I'm so very grateful to it. Um, I got to, went to university. I went to a pagan country that we all know called England and um, <laughs> wanting to convert, wanting to convert them to Christianity within the first semester or cert within the first term or certainly by the end of the first year, I realized that the only way to do that is to argue with people, to beat them in an argument, then humiliate them, then say to them, expect them to say, what must I do to be saved? And uh, it, two, 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 two of my first arguments were, were both debates that I was involved in. One was with a theologian uh, who was a student of Don Cupid's. He had an M. Phil from Cambridge. And of course, Don Cupid famously was, was the first atheist Anglican. Uh, a second one was with, was with a guy who was from an Islamic background, converted to Christianity, did his master's in, with the view of being a pastor, and then converted back to Islam with the goal of converting Britain to Islam. And in a, in a, in a strange way, the humiliation I faced in those two debates was an inoculation at what our culture is becoming, both from those of no faith and those of other faiths, predominantly Islam, but, but of other faiths, and, and trying to understand the uniqueness of Christ. And through the patience, and I emphasize the patience of loving Bible teachers, um, I began to see in an even more beautiful and an even more clear way the uniqueness of Christ, his, the prophecies, his birth, his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, and his impending return for which all of us live, and uh, became more convinced than ever before that, that, that Christ was the way, the truth, the hope, the, the, uh, the, and the life. And, but, but going forward, you know, we, we had a group of us who had a Bible study. I actually started off in Lisburn in County Antrim, and uh, we all went to different universities. And um, of that group, actually five of them decided to become pastors. Now six of them have become pastors. And they said, you know, you should be a pastor, Keith. You're not very good at preaching. You're not particularly holy. You're not that likable, but you still be a preacher. And they, they realized it wasn't, wasn't going to be a very good one. So, but my, I felt a strong calling to music. But, but what I wanted to do on, this, on the side was begin to write hymns that teach the Bible. So out of that, we started to write these hymns that teach the Bible. And in the providence of God, that became, that became my work. We started writing them in 2000. The first one was what was in Christ Alone, which came out in 2001. And that really opened doors to, to write hymns that really that, that we hope in some small way will, will help build deep believers. My hero, one of my heroes, arguably my biggest hero, was a man called Martin Luther. He wasn't perhaps the most consistent believer in all of history. Don't agree with everything he did and said. But, but he talked about the Reformation through the preaching and the singing of the Word. In fact, my friend Steve Nichols, often, who's at, who's at uh, Ligonier, often tells a story about Luther's, Luther, and Luther's illustration was he believed that, that the Word was as explained to us, is, is opened to us through the preaching and is carried out through the singing. Now, Dr. Piper will have a somewhat, somewhat more nuanced view of things, but it is an interesting thing, it is an interesting thing to think about that the songs we sing have a profound effect on our, our spiritual lives. 
So I want to just talk for about 10 minutes on, on why we sing and then, and then what happens while we sing, but by way of fast introduction. Um, so, so, so we sing, we sing in light, we, 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 we sing, I guess, in Scripture for three reasons. Number one, uh, we are commanded to sing. It is if we take the command to sing, and, and in fact, if we add extol, exalt, and, and praise, and all of those words together, it is, it is the most common command or exhortation in all of Scripture. It is something that is extraordinarily important to not to be, to be in God's family and, and company and regularly not singing, in fact, would be, would be disobedient. So we sing because we're commanded. It's so important if you're leading a service that we are, let our congregation know this is a command. This is something that's serious. This is not warm up. This is not something if you feel like you're in the mood for, but this is something that's command. In fact, oftentimes we actually encourage people, a really good exercise is just to get the whole congregation standing up and reading a psalm that commands or exhorts us to sing at the start. It immediately engages people. But it is the context of commanding. Not only does it, does it command us to sing, it, 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 the Bible is concerned with how we sing. We sing with thankfulness. Um, we sing with thankfulness. I think Andy touched it in his prayer. We sing with thankfulness. We, we also let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. The Psalms, full of the richness of the truths of the Bible. And we sing to one another. We are part of a group of people. It is we are not here uh, because of our own uh, narcissistic self-existence, but we're actually here as part of the body. We sing to one another. It is our responsibility. It is our love to one another. It is the very symbolism of being God's church. Secondly, we sing because we're commanded. We also sing because we're created to sing. All of us um, have been created with different voices. My wife has a beautiful voice. My wife came to me before our fall to her four years ago and said, Keith, um, we need to talk. Now, I don't know how many of you are married, but when your wife says to you, we need to talk, what usually follows is not, you need to be, let, you need, you need to be more selfish. Do you know what I mean? That's not really what's going to come next. So, so she said, uh, we've decided to switch your microphone off for the tour. And I said, but sweetheart, you know, I love to sing. And she goes, we, we all know that you love to sing. That's actually part of the problem. And I went, but, 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 but what about, you know, but, you know, but my, my, my picture's in the poster and everything. And she goes, I know, but, but it actually puts the band off because you're out of tune, but you're actually out of time as well when you sing. And, uh, and so the band just find it a little bit embarrassing. And I said, well, listen, I'm going to talk to the band about it. She goes, we have talked twice. And so you're not doing it. But, you know, the Lord, so my, 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 my voice might not be good enough to, to lead in a, in, a, in a concert setting, but it's still important. We have, we have three daughters, we have four daughters, when the three, the three of them share, the three that share a bedroom, and uh, we teach them a hymn a month. So, in the mornings we do like, we do devotions in the mornings because they're in a better mood, but at night time we go to bed, and we either, sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long, but we always sing the same hymn every day for the month, and then the next month we do the hymn every night. Some nights we sit and teach them what it means, we teach them the words, we get them to memorize it. Other nights we get up, we're so exhausted, we just go through it twice and switch the lights off. And, uh, but it's been a really good habit for helping our girls learn about the Lord, and uh, we're so grateful now, and I would encourage all of you to, to do it. But one month we were doing the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. So the first girl, Eliza, oldest child, uh, you know, always trying to impress, you know, goes, performs it perfectly, and then says, was that one, was it, was it my best performance yet? Dad? Yes, of course, Lassie, it was your best performance, well, well done. <laughs> Second child, rolling her eyes at the first child, do you want to, do you want to sing? No. Okay, well, let you, don't you sing then, Charlotte? I want to sing then. Okay, okay, then you sing. So she does it, a little bit more careless, doesn't really care. Third child, Gracie, she says, I want to sing, I want to sing. She wants to do everything her two older sisters do. The first time she ever crawled, she crawled right between her two sisters just to be part of the gang. And uh, anyway, so she sings, holy, 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 how I wonder what you are. <laughs> Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Holy, 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 blessed Trinity. <laughs> the point is, the Lord look, is delighted at all of our, our singing. In, in the same way as I am equally delighted at all my daughters singing, so the Lord looks down on believers and their sincere praise. And however you sing, is where, and that's important worship leaders hear that. It's important that we're encouraging our whole congregation. I have so many friends, business, business types, you know, guys that I watch Liverpool win the Champions League with. Sorry to drop that in, Mez. But, you know, who I watch, and, and they all say the same thing. They say, you know, well, you know, my wife's into music. She's emotional. She's kind of weird that way. I let her sing. I'm not really into it. No, we all sing. 
wherever we're from, whatever our socioeconomic background is, whatever our emotional makeup, however good we are at singing, we've all been created with a voice. God has created us. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, He's created you with that voice and purpose. So we're commanded to sing, we're created to sing, but most of all, the gospel of Jesus compels us to sing. The hymn says, how can I keep from singing? The scripture says something about the Lord. The Lord is my strength and my, my, the Lord is my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? Whatever it says, and then it responds by singing. It's what God's people do. Alistair Begg, who graced his pulpit for many years before he moved to Parkside, always talks about sitting up, watching out on a Sunday morning and watching someone coming in, perhaps a new convert, and watching her bring her spice in. And he'll, he'll tolerate the service, but the singing is excruciating for him. It's excruciating. But over time, as he, his eyes are open to the beauty of Christ and to the need of repentance and comes to faith, so you see this facial expression change over the weeks. And suddenly that guy sitting in the third pew up there, two to the left, that he sees every Sunday morning in that service, suddenly has joy in his face. When I first started dating Chris, and her dad's a church planter as well, and he used to get up in the mornings and listen to Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir sing on the old VHS videos. And there was a song, I'm clean, I'm clean. I've been washed by the blood. A guy whose life had been left for dead by a crack cocaine addiction, left on the streets, who had found Christ's blood, who, 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 had, who had responded to Christ's blood and righteousness, and his life was changed. He used to cry with, with tears rolling down his face. He's not gone to be with the Lord. He was a, the sweetest, sweetest of guys. But that is for all of us. And some of you, some of you may not know a, a dramatic conversion, but some of you may be able to sing like I'm able to sing that when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look. See right there. He made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Is that incredible? So we sing most of all because the gospel compels us. Dead men don't sing. We sing to the Father, through the Son, by the power of His Spirit. So that is, but that, that is the beginning of our singing. We are not creating PR for our church services. We are not creating an emotional warm-up for a preacher to knock it out of the park or an emotional warm-up for a preacher who, frankly, is just too boring. We are there to help God's people sing. That is our privilege. That is our privilege. And uh, just, I, I want to just look at what happens when we sing. I just want to look at individuals, families, congregations, and communities just for, for five, ten more minutes. Um, first of all, at an individual level, let's just look at this very quickly at an individual level. Let's remember as we choose our songs for a Sunday, let's remember as we lead our services that, that, that uh, what we sing profoundly affects every part of our lives. The, 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 the Psalms, the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms is, a, is like a beautiful artistic canvas on which God's glory is, is, is painted for all to see. And in, the, in that we sing of God's majesty, we sing of His holiness, we sing of His omnipresence, we sing of a God who is our judge, we sing of a God of wrath, we think, sing of a jealous God, we sing of a God who cannot tolerate sin, but we also sing of a God who is full of compassion, who, who is a God of peace, who, who is a God who is rich in love, who is longing to forgive and who delights in our praises. Let's make sure the songs that we sing on a Sunday are painting a deep and a broad picture and a high picture of the God of the Bible. If the songs we sing are simply, looking that God, are simply saying that God desires our praises and that He is loving in some kind of nebulous, nondescript, unqualified way, then but it, gets, but it gets us into some emotional trance. Don't, don't be surprised if in five or ten years later those people are, are looking elsewhere with their lives. And I'm not trying to draw straight lines here. Please understand that. But, but I, have, I have several of my closest friends are unbelievers, are atheists, and two of them would certainly describe Christianity as sim simple answers to difficult, sim oversimplistic answers to difficult questions. And the Psalms never allows us to think like that. A lot of what we sing today in our churches does. Let's make sure we are singing songs that, 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 uh, that, that paint an authentic picture of the God of the Bible. Authentic worship begins with an authentic picture of the God of the Bible. It does not begin with an authentic emotion. Se se secondly, on the individual, let's remember that the Psalms so beautifully illustrates uh, the whole spectrum of human emotion. We, 
We clap and we shout and we dance and we celebrate. That's just Scottish Baptists. And, uh, <laughs> but we, we are silent. We meditate. We have doubts. We have questions. We have anger. We lament. We repent. And sometimes we acknowledge, just have to acknowledge that He is God and that we are not. And these are, these are healthy emotions. You know, we, we, live, we live, many of us, if you're, if you're 44, I know I look a lot younger, but um, we live in this in-between generation where our parents came from the Stoic, the Stoic Scottish and Irish churches, and emotions were not talked about. And then we have kids who are singing these little songs and watching these Disney movies where emotions are worshipped, emotions are everything. And the Psalms so beautifully gives us a third way where we bring all our emotions honestly and with integrity before the Lord, and we acknowledge what we know about Him and let Him transform them, let Him, them, let him sanctify them. So secondly, make sure we have a, in the songs and in the prayers that we have a huge, that we have a, 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 a wide spectrum. Thirdly, let's make sure in, that, that, we, that, we, that, that we sing the gospel in our songs. That is our song. Christ's blood and righteousness is our song. Let's make sure both in the songs that we sing and in the services that we plan that the shape of the gospel is clear for everyone to see. Um, we, we have found, we, we, have, we, we were involved in our early years in doing a number of, of, of theater plays and things that, were, that, had, that had Christian overtones to them. It was a genuine attempt to be evangelistic. More people have been reached for the gospel by, in Christ alone, sung at a funeral or a wedding or... Or, or a commissioning service than, than all the efforts we made in those things. Singing the gospel in our hymns, we're singing to, to, the, to the whole congregation, to the believers, but also to the children, to the, to the unsaved spouses, to the guests in our services. Let's make sure the gospel is clear. And finally, let's make sure we sing about eternity. This is probably the most stark and the most, and the most sad thing we have in our services. When we go to the Psalms, when we go to the great hymns of the faith, about three quarters of them would talk directly about eternity, about heaven, about hell, about judgment, about a life beyond this life. Uh, a survey was done, which is one of the final straws that got us into writing hymns of the 1998 Spring Harvest Songbook. And at that time, that was very much the Bible of what was sung in British churches. And of the 182 songs, three of them, three out of 182 mentioned heaven, hell, the fact that we are one day judged or that we're eternal beings. Now, are you telling me that, that, that that is just purely a stylistic change in music? No, it's far more serious, isn't it? It's far more serious. So let's make sure we sing of, 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 of eternity, of, of our hope, of, of the whole truth. And don't let people live with a lie that this world is all there is because otherwise they're going straight out the door to eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow they die. So that's the first thing. What we sing profoundly affects us as individuals. Secondly, what we sing profoundly affects families. We come from cultures where families for generations sang hymns. We, you know, we, the very first time I met John MacArthur, I was, and I'll, sorry, Dr. Piper, I'll be honest and just say I was, I was actually terrified. I didn't know what he was going to say, and he said, I would like to speak to you. So I got more terrified. And I went back and he said, you know what, what a privilege it is that you were, that you were born Scotch-Irish? That's what he said. That was his first thing. It wasn't a theological thing. And he said, it was, because you were born Scotch-Irish, it was because your music, your melodies are, are, are caught in a community. They're sung in, in sports matches and in homes and in pubs and in churches. That is what happens. Well, Dr. MacArthur didn't say pubs, but, but they're, sung, they're, sung, they're sung in all parts of our culture as, as cultural things. Our, mu our melodies are that way. We're born in this culture. And it's so important. It's so important that our homes are filled with songs of the Lord. It's so utterly crucial. Um, he, he actually said on another occasion, you know, it's, uh, just the importance of, of filling your home with songs. He said, hit me, fill your home where life happens. So in the car in the kitchen, where life happens. Fill your homes with songs of the Lord. The New England Puritans who came from these islands were the, were the first people to bring across to America were known. I'm told by Joel Bakey that, that they were known for not allowing men to take communion on a Sunday if they didn't pray and sing with their family each day. Now, I think it's probably an overreach of the, 
of, of, of the Lord's Supper, but, but, but it tells us something about where culture has changed. All our children have songs. All our families have songs. All our children are going to, they will influence their hearts and their imaginations and their minds and their memory banks and their words and their prayers and their lives. Let's make sure that our, our homes are filled. And, and apart from anything else, families that sing in their homes of the Lord sing well at church on a Sunday, don't they? So the third thing is how we fill our congregations. Very quickly, the, uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm way over time already, uh, the importance of the, the sound in our congregations. Um, Dr. Piper was interviewed at the conference on Saturday, and w when he was interviewing for Chuck Stedham for the position of music director in his church, he, he said, and I paraphrase, and I hope I paraphrase correctly, that he wants, wants the musical sound of his church to be the sound of the congregation. How do you as a musician help that? Do you hear that? What's the music like in your church? The sound of the congregation singing, okay? I'm going to rehearse that with you all. You're going to reply back, okay? What's the music like in your church? That's it. Everything we do is built around that. So as musicians, as we plan, as we plan this, I'm not telling this to make you do fake hypocrisy or anything like that. I'm saying, as musicians, what is your goal and what do you do? As a musician, I constantly have a, a goal in what I am doing, whether it's a broadcast or a concert or a church service or, or playing in our living room with, some of our, with my kids. There is a goal. Our goal with all our musicians, with our with all, our, with, with, with all our musicians, with, with our choirs, with our bands, with the, the drummer that's you know, full of testosterone and plays too loud, with the young girl that wants to be on Pop Idol, with, with, with the choir member that's just that little bit awkward, is to help the congregation sing. We build cultures that way. Um, I, I do believe congregational singing, incidentally, you know, it's, it, it, is, it is an outworking of, 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 of believers. True, true spiritual worship is an outworking of believers that are alive, congregations that are alive. But after that, senior pastors, it is your job. It is, it is, I believe it is under your watch to make sure your congregation are singing. Thirdly, I think that your hymns, the songs that you choose, need to sing well. They need to be songs that primarily fit your congregation, not primarily songs that fitted the previous congregation or are on Christian radio. They need to fit your congregation. Fourthly, your music man needs to know what Chuck Stedham at Bethlehem Baptist understood, and that was his every creative ounce is given to helping his congregation sing. And, uh, and fifthly, we build a creative culture with all our musicians that does the same thing. So anyway, real quickly then, finally, that our, our singing is a witness. First of all, our singing should fire us to witness. Singing the gospel and singing about mission is important because it fires us to witness. Um, Obviously, you know, we, we, we think of the stories of, uh, of so many missionaries uh, for, whom, for whom, you know, hymns were an energizing to them, but, but, but also that our singing is a witness. When we sing on a Sunday, when two or three are gathered, it is a legal term, but we are bearing testimony. So let's remember as we gather together on a Sunday that, 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 that there will be unbelievers with us. It's a powerful thing. I have a friend who is Islamic, who, who was Islamic, who became Christian by being in a worship service and the sheer unique power of God's people singing on a Sunday. This old man called Cliff Barrows used to do the music for the Billy Graham organization. Each year he'd come to our concerts and we'd go, to, we'd go to lunch with him. And it was always just a golden hour where he'd talk about his life of experiences. And I said, why, why did you insist in congregational singing in your crusades when other evangelists, evangelists have, have shied away? And he said, well, there's something, there is something that draws people. That sincere congregational singing that is, ma that, that is married to a life that matches, just does. Could, because there's nothing else like it in the world. So we have a wonderful chance to reach these streets by having congregations that are dynamically and passionately singing the gospel to one another on Sunday. And I hope each one of us uh, can, 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 can t take advantage of that. I'm going to teach you, I guess I have to teach a, a psalm, don't do it if I'm in Scotland. Shall I do one song, then some questions, then one song? Is that okay? Is that okay, Matthew? Where's my, Andy, is that okay? One psalm, question and answer, one, one song. Is that okay? So we started last year a challenge that will probably put me in my grave, which is to create a 21st century Psalter. We're about four in. And uh, so the first one we did was Psalm 130. Um, can we put it up there? I will wait. Can somebody put the words up? Um, we're going to send these all to you so you'll have free copies of them all. Um, psalm 130, the De Profundis. It was St. Augustine's favorite psalm. It was 
I believe John Calvin's and Martin Luther's and Charles Wesley's. So we're covering every theological corner here. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the principle of lament is sorely lacking in our services, isn't it? You know, we, we, we see so many people, you know, it, it, there was a survey, somebody did a survey of, of Northern Irish culture a few years ago, and I suspect slightly different to yours, but not entirely dissimilar, where a couple of generations ago, you know, the rebels in the family would, would, would oftentimes, in, in times of tragedy or bereavement, either com, come closer to the church again or allow their children to become closer to the church again. Our generation, there is more evidence that in bereavement and tragedy, people leave the church because there is no there is no authentic expression of grief or lament in our services. It's a terrible indictment, isn't it? It's not what the Psalms wanted. It's not, it's not what I believe what any biblical pattern or understanding of the gospel would, 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 would desire. But anyway, so this is Lord from the Depths. We did, we did this tune and we brought the band over to Port Braddon Harbour in the, in the, in the township of Bush Mills in the north coast of Ireland. It was, and we went outside on the break to have a coffee and I looked across and saw Scotland and I thought, I thought two things. I thought, my dad started being a church organist in Bush Mills Presbyterian. I wonder what psalm tune he did in the Scottish Psalter, because the Presbyterian Church in Ireland used the Scottish Psalter. And, uh, and I looked across the sky. Oh, so actually, I couldn't, I called, I called David, what's his name? I called uh, David Robertson, actually, I called and said, what tune do you sing to Psalm 130? And so he started in his horrible voice uh, singing, singing Martyrdom. Very nice positive name, isn't it? Martyrdom. So, so what we do is, we do the first two verses of the Scottish Psalm, then we go into a ballad, then we come back to the final two verses of the Scottish Psalm at the end. So do you want to give it a shot? Hands up who knows this already. There's a few doing it already. Okay. So excuse my voice. It's not very good, I know. I've been told enough times. <laughs> so let's stand up, shall we? And I'm so excited tonight about hearing... Lots of people in a room sing this gorgeous old Scottish psalm tune. Here we go. One, two. Lord, from the depths I Let's hear, the, let's hear the harmonies. Lord, ballad now. Here we go. Completely and forever one by 
like Christ emerging from the grave, now work has come to break away, and God himself has paid a price that all who trust in me today find healing in his sacrifice. I will wait. I will wait for you. I will Please take a seat. What wonderful saying. Amen. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Isn't it just so encouraging to sing to one another? Isn't it? Just remind each other of these things. What a great thing. Okay. I have 10 minutes to go. Is that right? So 10 questions, one minute each. Let's just do questions. We'll forget about the, the songs. Okay. So here's the rules. Number one, you can ask anything you want. Number two, I can answer whichever question I want. <laughs> Number three, it has to be a question. Number four, it has to be one sentence. Okay? So a one sentence question. I don't want like a, a sermon about something. Do you know what I mean? Sermons are great, but not now. So if you've got a one sentence question, let's hear it. Here we go. Here. How do you encourage the congregation to sing out more? How do we encourage the congregation to sing out more? Gosh, look. <laughs> there, I mean, I, 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 the principles that earlier I would say are, are important. Obviously, obviously we want we want believers and, and, and encourage them. Then, as believers, you know, you, 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 you use the scriptures. You know, to, like I suggest, you know, read the scriptures at the start. Remind them. Number two, the senior pastor. He is the, he is the ultimate uh, human authority of a congregation. It needs to be coming from him. Over the, we've traveled America for 12 years. We've seen, uh, we've seen, we, we've been in churches with 20,000 people. We've been in churches with 200, and it doesn't matter size, socioeconomics, theology, anything. The com most single biggest human common denominator, apart from a congregation that is just made alive in Christ, the human, is, is a pastor that cares. It is the pastor's job to be encouraging his people, to be reminding them of why they sing. Thirdly, you, you find the songs they sing well. Um, I mean, obviously, many people here come from a, a tradition of, of psalm singing, um, or even they just heard their parents, it may just be they had their parents love to sing them, and their parents sung them with love and passion, so they do the same. But that, this sings well here. Do you know what I mean? There's certain other songs that wouldn't sing as well. Similarly, they don't sing this as well in America. Sure, they don't, John. They don't sing the psalms as well in America, I don't think. You know, so so we're, we're in an education process here. So find out, find out the core songs that sing well. 
Um, I hate to use the illustration, but I will since I'm in Scotland. You know, Gordon Ramsay on the, on the, on the show is when the restaurant's doing badly, he goes down to, you know, one starter, two main courses, one dessert and coffee. Get those five things right and build from there. But we do the same thing. We find the 20, 30 songs that sing well and we focus on them and then we gradually build out. Uh, fourthly, fourthly, I, th I think we need, we need to, you know, as musicians, as music leaders, take the lead, take it seriously and play in ways that help them sing. And fifthly, those that help us from production to musicians, to choir, to everybody else. We need to get a unified team that all we do is help our congregation sing. And then we look back in a year at how it's changed, doing you know, that kind of thing. So I hope that's helpful for the start. Next question. Good. Uh, you heard the question, did you, everyone? How do you deal with how do you deal with a nice person who desperately wants to be in front of the microphone and has no talent? Is that the question? Okay. <laughs> so, well, uh, for, first of all, first of all, any stage, any stage, any stage is, is you know, is is, I, uh, what's the word? It, it's an experience that goes to our head a little bit. Do you know what I mean? So, I I would quite I think. I think I mean, there's a lot of different things. I think personal, personal integrity is important. I think a strong church government and leadership is important, that we, we put people in positions who do that. I presume you're now talking about a corrective position, that they're already there. Is that right? They're already there. Okay, they're already there. Yikes. Okay. So, I mean, I, honestly, I think you just have to say, help your congregation sing. And if this person isn't helping the congregation, you have to find a way of just explaining to them why, and, and, but privately and in love and finding a better, a better option. I would probably try and encourage them first. There are some people, you know, we live in a generation, there's so much confusion. You know, cr church music is actually in large part governed by Wall Street today. Over half of Christian radio, over, or about half of Christian radio and, and over half of Christian music is actually owned by Wall Street companies. So the, the message that's coming through is so, is so confused that we're in a generation that most church musicians are actually confused about what they're doing on Sunday morning anyway. So I would take time to see if you can improve them. Say, look, let's simplify this and let's try and help our people sing and try and go on a journey with them. But if not, I think you do have to lovingly explain to them. Um, and I think if they are genuinely holy, they will probably be genuinely disappointed and allow them time to be disappointed, but move on. If they, if, if, if they don't accept it, if they don't accept it, maybe bring two or three others and, and help a few of them explain to them. And if they still don't accept it, there is probably a holiness question with them. Do you know what I mean? But this is, you know, anything to do with music is very emotional. Do you know what I mean? And, and so we have to understand. I, I would say give people time, try and teach them, give people time to express their emotions. But, but at the same time, we have to lead our, our service as well. And so I hope that's helpful. Next question. How do you introduce psalm singing? How do you introduce hymn singing? So, uh, how do you introduce psalm singing? The same question could be asked. How do we introduce singing more deep hymns if it's a church that for 10 years have sung not so deep hymns? Um, both, to, me, to me, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, I, my, my role in our family is I love early in the mornings. My energy goes like this during the day. Okay, I start at about 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm at my peak. 5 o'clock post first coffee. I'm at my peak. And then I just gradually get tired. So my job in our family is I do morning with the girls, 6 to 9. So I've watched each of our girls go from milk to, uh, to little breakfast muesli to eating their first banana to eating, you know, gradually eating foods that they can, they can chew on to other foods. I think all of us, you know, I think anything that has a physical activity has elements of that to it. Um, so, I, but, but how do we do that? So I think we begin with the why. We explain to our people why it's important. We explained to our people, you know, last year, Kristen and I did, we, we, we've used Tim Keller's book on the Psalms. Tim Keller's got a daily devotional on the Psalms, which we've used for the last three years. I think it's great, but I think it's great mostly because it just gets you reading the Psalms. So this morning was Psalm 73, who have I in heaven but you and earth, nothing that is beside you. But it, it, it informs every part of our day. It's a, and it's a, it's a rich emotional experience, but it's a rich experience of where you each day you, you, you you, you, you focus on the glory of God in a, in a very beautiful and artistic way. We're artistic beings. You know, we're not just simply, you know, uh, you know, theological equations. Do you know what I mean? So I think we explain why we do it. And then I think what we do is 
I mean, this is just pragmatic leadership now. What I would do is I would set yourself five-year targets. So this year I would say, let's get four of them and really get them good. So you take, maybe you take something like Psalm 130 that works there. Take your best tune to Psalm 23 that works for your church. Take singing Psalm 100, all people up on earth do dwell. And take an opening song. Well, we've got one called May the People's Praise You. There's, there's lots of opening songs, but there's lots of other people have done them. Matt, Matt Barron's got one called Blessed Be Your Name, which is pretty close to the psalm, pretty good in the psalm. But there's, but, so you just take a collection of them. Um, actually, no, you want full psalms. Think of, but take four for the year and go, let's really get to love these. Let's do these well and sing those. Then next year you do six. The following year you do eight. The following year you do 10. And then year five you do two. By year five, you're, you're basically a psalm singing church. You know, by year five, you've got 50 psalms that you sing well, which there, there probably aren't that many, even, you know, traditional Reformed churches that can do that. Do you know what I mean? So, I've built it and build it. And, and so, you know, always underestimate. The, the idiot overestimates what he can achieve in a year. You know, the smart guy works it out in over five and then puts a plan in place one year at a time, you know? So, I, I, that, that would be my suggestion, if, I, if that's helpful. Just as a, sorry to be, I don't know your context, so I may be slightly culturally wrong. So, please forgive me if I'm insensitive there. Next question. Next question. How do you uh, pursue humility in an upfront row? Gosh, how do you pursue humility in an upfront row? Um, I think it is harder, but, <clears throat> but all of us have got to try and pursue humility. Do you know what I mean? You know, I, I know, is it, is it, is it, is it easier, is it, is, it, is, it harder to, is it harder not to be a snob? In, 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 in one, in, in the schemes or in, in, in the whatever church, you know, every community has its own form of snobbery and that kind of stuff. So I, I don't want to pretend that it, that, 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 is, that it's different. Everybody, everybody, you know, has that. I, I do think the upfront thing is weird because you get, you get complimented more. People laugh at your jokes even when they're not funny. Do you know what I mean? So I'm saying this, something that people are laughing and I'm hearing in the background, everybody back home going, you're not funny, Keith. That wasn't really funny. They're just being nice. Do you know what I mean? So you do get complimented a little bit more. I, 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 think, I think it gets down to basics. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think if your priority in life is your prayer life, I think that's important. If your priority in life is, I mean, for us, it's, you know, it's, it's, we, we, we try to begin every day with, 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 with we, we work harder on our own devotional life. I'm an extrovert. You know, 5% of creative artists are extrovert. I'm in that 5%. Do you know what I mean? I don't like reading, being by myself. You know, but we've had to really work at that. My wife, I think in our marriages, praying in our marriages, I'd recommend as something that has really helped me. My wife, my wife has such a beautiful understanding of the glory of God and the grace of God that, that we have created such a transparency in our marriage that I think she, she really, more than a human being, you know, has really helped me that way. You know, we, we, we pray, we had to work, for, it took us years, even with the public ministry, it took us years to learn to pray together. And actually, when we got pregnant, she got pregnant with Talia, I would go in in the mornings, I'm going to pray with her, and she'd go, Keith, I'm feeling nauseous. I didn't sleep during the night. I really don't want your smug face beside me praying right now. <laughs> so, so what we did was we, we would text each other prayers. And I've got, I got to tell you guys, that is revolutionary. If you, I mean, with any, anything has got dangers, but you know, if you text your prayers to your wife in the morning and write her a text letter and then send her a prayer, here's what I was praying for today. That is revolutionary. And most days she just goes thanks back, and some days she sends a prayer back. And but, but it is a it is a process that, so so your prayer life, the prayer life in your marriage, the prayer life with your kids, praying with your kids every morning, is important. And then just being stuck in, in your local church, having having the wisdom to have your two or three close friends, and then and then just being stuck in a local church, understanding that you know we've always, we've never been paid by our church, uh, uh, but. But we've always lived right beside our church. When we were with Alistair, it was like that. We lived across the street from the church for four years. And now in Nashville, you know, we live, we live about, about 600 yards from our pastor and about one mile from the church. And we're there all the time. Our, our offices are now in the church buildings as well. So we've, we're, we're, we're passionate. Chris's dad was a church planter. We're local church people, even though we're not on staff per se. So I think all of those things, just doing those things, you know, I do think I do think those things help. I think the importance of Sabbath, you know, you know, of rest, you know, is important. But um, I don't know. That's that's how we've tried to deal with it, and we're not, I suspect, not overly successful at it. But I hope it's helpful. Um, next question here. Yeah, I think we need both. I, I don't know what else I would say. I, I mean, 
Um, Dr. Piper, would you say anything on that one? The balance between songs to God and to each other? I, I mean, because I, co congregational worship is both all the time. I think we're singing to the Lord and to one another all the time. Um, I think people need more help addressing God. Yeah. With affection. Yeah. Um, but both are crucial. And they're yeah. both sung to God. Yeah. And both sung to each other. Yeah, yeah. I agree with Dr. Piper. <laughs> Next question. Next question. Here. Is body language important? Well, body language is always important. When I'm addressing my wife, when I'm addressing my daughters, when I'm addressing somebody afterwards today, when I'm addressing the taxi driver, uh, body language is always important. Are you specifically referring to hands raised, or what are you referring to? Yeah, I, I think you can over, I think you can over, I mean, I, I don't get into the, the, the nuances of that, do you know what I mean? I come from a Presbyterian background and we lead services of worship. So in my circle of friends are, you know, when I'm, when we're, when we're, when we're, when we're with Sinclair Ferguson and when we're with a um, African-American gospel choir, they have different body languages when they sing, Okay. Neither I, neither I just, neither I, neither I look at as, as, for 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 sincere, for level of sincerity. I think somebody who looks disinterested, or somebody who is excited about Liverpool's Champions League win, and tepid about congregational singing, I think that is atrocious. That is disgraceful. Um, that doesn't mean that. That doesn't mean that you know, cheering Origi's goal is the same kind of cheering that celebrating the greatness of the holiness of God is. That's not to say that. But there should be an equal intensity. There should be, they should, if, if you're more intense about one than the other, I, th I think that's a terrible thing. So, so yeah, I think body language is important, but I don't think, I don't think the style, I don't think you should be trying to hemorrhage everyone into the same style. And increasingly, as our churches become more multicultural, I think we should think far less about that and just enjoy the beauty of, 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 of multicultural worship, especially in the cities, and, and multi-generational worship. Because children, children, you know, have a, have a different response to adults. And we can learn from each other. If our kids are smiling at singing, like our kids were on Sunday, were singing some hymn with thankfulness with a smile on their face, and I realized I didn't have a smile on my face. So, you know, so I, I learned from that, you know, but, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't use it as a measuring stick, but, um, but it is important. Let me done. Okay, Andy, thank you. Do you want to pray? Why don't you pray? Sure, I'd love to. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for all these people, for all the churches that are represented, for the families that are represented, for the lives that, that have been made alive in you. And uh, Father, we pray that as we go through this day that, 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 that you will be continuing to encourage us, to, to inspire us, and uh, that, that lives and families and churches in Scotland will be changed through this work. Especially we pray for the 20 schemes. We thank you for the courage of these guys. May each of us find in our, in our, own, in our own ways how we can be encouraging um, them and all they do. For Christ's name, amen.